Congressman Jim McGovern is our guest this morning. Let's go on the record. The Democrat from Worcester is well accustomed to D.C. power shifts. Now in the minority, can he continue to shape policy as the ranking member on the Rules Committee? Can bipartisanship still happen? The congressman's in the chair. Let's go on the record this morning. From WCVB Channel 5, the inside word from Washington to Beacon Hill. Today's newsmakers are going on the record. Welcome to OTR, everyone. I'm Ed Harding, along with New Center 5's political reporter, Sharma Sikhetti. It's great to have you with us. As you can see, Jim McGovern joins us this morning at the table. He represents the state's 2nd Congressional District and has served in Congress since 1997. A Democrat, now the ranking member on the Influential Rules Committee, a native of Worcester, holds a BA in history and a master's in public administration from American University. Congressman, it's always great to see you. Thanks for coming up. Today. Happy to be with you. Great both. to see you. All right, welcome. So we want to start with you made one of the most memorable comments of the new Congress recently. Uh, you said McCarthyism had returned to the Capitol. Now, we're not talking about Kevin McCarthy. Tell us what you meant and what led you to say that. Well, I mean, uh, based on, you know, what their priorities are. It's about going after uh, Democratic members of Congress. It's uh, They just went after Ilhan Omar, get, throwing her off the Foreign Affairs Committee. They did so out of spite, uh, out of revenge. Uh, they're, they're targeting federal employees uh, uh, in their new rules. They want to be able to terminate uh, the salaries of, of uh, bureaucrats that they don't agree with. Um, and, you know, and we just did a, had a big debate uh, on whether we should condemn socialism or not. I mean, it's like the new Red Scare. So rather than focusing on inflation, jobs, and on kitchen table issues, they're focused in on all this other garbage. And and your, your argument is that's what Republicans ran on. Yeah, I mean, Republicans claim they were going to focus on inflation and jobs like a laser beam, but they're focusing on all the extreme stuff. And look, the, le the lesson of the last election was that people do not want extreme. I mean, they, we, we picked up a seat in the Senate, uh, the, the red wave turned into a pink splash. Uh, and uh, so, I mean, the bottom line is, uh, the message is that people do not want extreme. They want us to get stuff done. You, you, you mentioned Elon Omar, and, and I'd like to touch on that a little bit, because it's not unusual for the speaker to pull off a member of the other party from a committee. And Nancy Pelosi wouldn't let Jim Jordan on the January 6th committee. I mean, it, it's not unusual. Yeah, I mean, you know, they point to the way we treated Marjorie Taylor Greene and Paul Gosar. The difference here is both of those individuals threaten violence against another member. Um, Ilan Omar said something that was inappropriate that many viewed as anti-Semitic. And she, she apologized, apologized for, it. for it. Right. And by the way, she even voted against. Uh, she she even voted for a resolution to condemn anti-Semitism. And you know who didn't? Twenty-three Republicans uh, voted uh, against a resolution condemning anti-Semitism. So this is all crazy. But we need to get back to focusing on on issues that people really care about. And Republicans under Kevin McCarthy's leadership. When we were talking about McCarthy, and of course it was Joe McCarthy, but under. Kevin McCarthy's leadership were able to remove the three prominent Democrats from their committees as we continue this conversation. Elar Omar from Foreign Affairs, Adam Schiff, Eric Swalwell from Intelligence. McCarthy says that these were not tit for tat moves, different, he says, from what Democrats did to Republicans when they held a majority. What, what, is it different? It is different. Again, uh, Paul Gosar and uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene threatened violence to kill other members yeah, of Congress. I mean, you know, I mean, being on a committee is a privilege. If you threaten to kill another member of Congress, you know what? Then you shouldn't be on a, on a committee, and certainly not be, be not be not on a committee, you know, with the person you threatened. And by the way, um, Marjorie Taylor Greene just a, a couple of weeks ago said that if she were involved in the January 6th attack, she would have been armed or she would have won. And you know what the Republicans did? You know what Kevin McCarthy did? He he put her on the Homeland Security Committee. So, I mean, come on, this is crazy, right? I mean, the bottom line is Kevin McCarthy had to make a lot of promises to get votes to become speaker. I mean, four days, 15 rounds, he finally became speaker. But he gave everything away, including his dignity. And, and one content in his dignity, one contentious confrontation on the floor with Matt Gates. Yeah. So, I mean, the deal is Marjorie Taylor Greene, despite all of her history of anti-Semitism, of threatening violence, was rewarded a seat on the Homeland Security Committee, uh, and uh, and it, you know this is you know this is it shows that a, a a fringe group of the Republican conference is calling the shots. These aren't Republicans like we all know uh, here in Massachusetts or Republicans like John McCain. These are the most extreme elements, people who are uh, election deniers who deny the Holocaust, who hang around with bigots and white supremacists. It really is quite concerning. All right, we want to move on. President Biden set to make his State of the Union speech on Tuesday. He will walk into a very different House chamber this time around. Do you want to see him put immigration policy on the front burner? Uh, yeah, I do. I, I mean, I've, I've been wanting, we need immigration reform in this country. 
you know, talk to any business in the United States of America. They want immigration reform. Um, and to the extent that we can deal with the situation at the border, we need to have an honest uh, and holistic conversation. How it's, do you think the president's handled that situation? I, I, th I think he has handled it the best that he can, given the fact he's getting no help from Congress. Uh, but uh, the bottom line is more needs to be done. And here's what I mean by that. You know, a lot of the, you, we have to understand why are people coming to our border? People, you, know, you, you have families coming to our border because gangs are threatening their children, threatening to kill their children. You have people coming because the economies in their home countries are in disarray. Some of the reason why those economies are in disarray are directly related to U.S. policy. Let me give you a, a suggestion. You know, how about we ease up on the sanctions on Cuba and Venezuela? Um, and, you know, I think that in and of itself would help quell the number of people coming to our border because hundreds of thousands are coming from Cuba and Venezuela because we're tightening up on the sanctions. And many Venezuelan immigrants, immigrants 49, um, were flown to Martha's Vineyard from Florida, Governor Ron DeSantis, ostensibly, he says, to make a point. Um, did he make that point, do you think? No, I mean, he was, he, he was he's into make, you know, this was a political stunt. He's into, you know, he, that's human trafficking, quite frankly. And it's disgusting that you treat people fleeing economic turmoil and, and treat them as political do, pawns. Do you think that Congress, is there a place, there was eventually a place where Congress was able to come together on gun safety and pass something? Do you think it's possible that Congress can come together on immigration and pass something? Anything is possible, and, I'm all, and people like me are willing. I mean, when George W. Bush was president, um, I was supporting his effort on immigration reform, even though it wasn't what I all that I wanted. But the Republicans, the rank and file Republicans said, no, look, we need to help the dreamers. We need to help regularize the status of temporary protected status holders. I mean, these are people who have been in this country for decades, um, have families, have businesses. We need to help them. Um, and then we need to you know, deal with the realities at the border. And by the way, not in just spouting sound bites, but in actually thoughtful, reasonable, rational reforms that can help these people get to safety if they need it, but also to dissuade people from coming to our border. Let's talk about getting business done in your chamber with, with the switch to with the switch in the House. The, the, you know, the Democrats are no longer the majority party. So you are no longer chairman of the Rules Committee. You are, as we said at the top of the show, a ranking member. Same for Richie Neal over in Ways and Means, a ranking member. So how does that how does that, does that change your approach and do you see opportunities for bipartisan cooperation? Yeah, well, based on the first few weeks, let me tell you, Root Canal is more pleasant <laughs> than some of the committee hearings oh, I've been no. in. But the bottom line is, is this. I mean, I, uh, and on the Rules Committee, my chairman now is uh, Congressman Tom Cole of Oklahoma, a good, decent, honorable man. I, I look forward to working with him. Unfortunately, part of the deal that Kevin McCarthy struck with some of the extremists was they wanted seats on the Rules Committee. So now we have some people that, quite frankly, um, I'm trying to think of a good way to say it. Or, as my daughter would say, "cray cray." I mean, yeah, totally cray -cray. out yeah. of the out of the out of the out of the mainstream of conservatism. Uh, and so these are people into conspiracy theories. These are people who are uh, anti-vaxxers. Uh, these are people who are not interested in getting anything done, but they want more Twitter followers and maybe an appearance on Tucker Carlson. But they're not interested in getting things done, and that makes it a little bit more difficult. Look, our focus has to be on getting stuff done. So I'm willing to work with anybody if we have common ground. And I'm also going to be focused on working with the administration to implement some of the historic legislation that we've passed in the last two years, from the infrastructure bill to the biggest investment to combat climate change, you know, to dealing with our supply chain issues. We passed this CHIPS bill. We need to implement all that stuff. Uh, and so a lot of my focus will be on that. You've made fighting hunger one of your top priorities as a member of Congress. During the height of the COVID pandemic, the federal government made school lunches free uh, for students. Last summer, the former governor and lawmakers here at the state level extended that for another year. There is a bill right now at the state level to make this permanent, but federal funds would be needed for that to happen. Is the money there? And do you think that could become a reality? So I'm working with the state legislator, uh, Representative Vargas and Senator uh, DiDomenico um, and others. Uh, I've also talked to Governor Healy about this. I mean, we ought to make it permanent here in Massachusetts. Uh, California has done it. Vermont has done it. Colorado has just done it. Only a handful yeah, of states. Only a handful of states. Right, so, right. Uh, but to make it a little bit more palatable, 
I'm working right now with the Secretary of Agriculture, Tom Vilsack, to get him to expand what we call community eligibility, to make more students uh, uh, free lunches uh, uh, refundable by the federal government. And so we already have a, 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 a number of schools that fall in that category. We need to expand it and then have the state do the rest. But universal free meals for every child ought to be something that we're all dedicated to getting done. Um, it, it, it will help kids learn better in school. It, 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 remo it, it removes it removes stigma. Yeah. Um, and you know what? My two sisters are school teachers, and they'll tell you that that school meal is every bit as important to a child's ability to learn as a textbook should, or a laptop. Should, should it be just the one meal or two meals? Should it be I, breakfast I, I and lunch? I think it should be two meals, to be honest with you. Sure. Look, I mean, uh, you know, nutrition and food um, is essential to your ability to learn. Yeah. And yeah. to the extent that we don't recognize that kids are not yeah. learning in school. Um, and, uh, and by the way, we have a hunger problem in this country. 35 million of our fellow citizens do not know where the next meal is going to come from. This is, this, this is the reality in the richest country in the history of the world. We all should be ashamed. And I, you know, I, I pushed President Biden to do a White House conference on hunger, nutrition, and health. They have a, a roadmap out there that is ambitious but doable. And again, a, a big chunk of my time during the next two years is going to be working with them to make sure that that national st strategy is implemented.